Okay, if you want to grab your Bibles and go to the book of Romans, uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, we're kind of in the middle of a study of the book of Romans. We're actually going to be uh, finishing the last few verses of uh, chapter 9 today, and then we'll be going through chapter 10. Uh, but uh, when you turn to the book of Romans, uh, you, you come to a book that is, that is just rich, 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 and in in giving us an understanding of, of God's plan for us. Uh, of God's design uh, to bring about salvation. And, and really, as Paul develops this, this treatise of his, he, he is delving into some of, uh, some of the major uh, doctrinal things that, that are important for Christians to know about. And uh, I'll throw this outline up here just really quick in case you haven't been here. Uh, this is the general outline. It's a little more detailed than this. But he dealt at the beginning with, with the concept of sin. The fact that everybody, everybody has sinned uh, and therefore everybody needs the righteousness of God. And that, that theme of the righteousness of God uh, permeates throughout this book. And we're going to see a lot of it in today's study. Uh, but the fact that uh, chapter 1 and verse uh, 16 and 17 talks about the fact that the gospel is God's plan of salvation uh, for everybody. And uh, it's, the, it's the revelation of God's righteousness for us. And it's what we all need. We all need it because we've sinned. God brings about justification, which is the means by which He makes us right uh, in His eyes. And when God justifies us, uh, He sanctifies us. He sets us apart, makes us free from death and from sin, uh, from the old law. Uh, and uh, as we started last week in chapter 9, he, he, He's dealing with a, a three-chapter sec section here, chapters 9, 10, and 11, where He's really contrasting the Jews and the Gentiles. Church in Rome would have been made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And he's developing this section especially for the benefit of the Jews to try to get their attention, to try to wake them up to what God had uh, planned for them. And, uh, and so in this section, he's, uh, he's trying to focus in on what happened to the Jews. They were rejected by God. Uh, why were they rejected? Was it because God forgot the promises that He made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Uh, was there a breach of faith, a breach of contract there? No, last week we looked at chapter 9, said it was, uh, it was Israel that uh, made that decision. Uh, they were rejected not because God broke His promises, not because God is not just, uh, not because God is not fair, uh, but he, he, uh, God rejected them because they rejected Him. And that's what we're going to see throughout our study this morning. We're going to begin in, in Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. And we're going to go uh, throughout the, the rest of chapter 10 and look at the fact that, uh, the fact that God rejected Israel as a nation uh, was not just some flippant decision. It was not just some arbitrary uh, decision that He made. Uh, it came about as a result of what Israel uh, had done and the choices uh, that they had made themselves. And as you think about this, I want you to back up and, and look in verse 25. These are some verses we did not really get to investigate last week. But I want you to look in verse 25 and verse 27 and verse 29. And I want you to see that God is quoting from Hosea in the Old Testament. And then He quotes from Isaiah and then He quotes from Isaiah again. And what He's doing is, is He's helping the Jews, hopefully, helping the Jews to see that the fact that they were rejected by God as a nation was foretold by the prophets. This should not have been a surprise. Uh, the, the prophets had foretold that the day would come that, uh, that God would, would no longer be able to look to Israel as his, as his people. And the reason for it was because they had made a choice. They had made a decision, not because of some arbitrary decision of God, but because they had made the decision, you know what, we're... We're going we're gonna to turn away from God. And so I want you to look at these last three verses of, of chapter 9, and, uh, or last four verses, and you're going to see that God rejected them because Israel refused to accept Christ for who He was. Verse 30, He says, What shall we say then? Here's what, he's, here's what we're going to say. That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, generally speaking, the Gentiles were not interested in pursuing righteousness, particularly that righteousness that was according to the law. But he says those Gentiles have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. Here were the Gentiles. 
They were not a, an overly religious people. They were not necessarily concerned about pursuing righteousness according to God's law, but they have attained unto the righteousness that comes by faith. What's the first word you got in verse 31? But, but you're going to see a contrast here. You're going to see a contrast here between the Gentiles and the Jews. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, Gentiles, they weren't pursuing it, and they, and they attained it. Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, they haven't attained the raw law of righteousness. Well, why not? How can one group of people attain the righteousness that comes by faith while perhaps as, as, a, as a group of people, they were not pursuing that. Here's another group of people, they were pursuing it, but they didn't attain it. How's that possible? Well, he gives the answer. Verse 32, he's asking the same question we just asked. Why? Why did that happen? Because they did not seek the righteousness. They did not seek it by faith. But as it were, they sought it by the works of the law. What does that mean? They thought that they could earn it. They thought that they could do enough of their own works. They thought that they could build up a, a system of their own traditions and their own uh, laws in such a way that God would just be obligated to them to give it to them. Is that how it works? That's not how it works. But that's what they thought. They didn't attain it by faith. By, by their works of doing the works of the law of Moses. And so the end of verse 32 says, what did they end up doing? They stumbled at the stumbling stone. What does that mean? What's, what's the stumbling stone? How could they stumble at the stumbling stone? What, what is a stumbling stone? What is it? Henry, what's the stumbling stone? Well, we, we, we need to make sure that, that we're not following after the, the path of the, of the Jews and, uh, and building up our own system of laws and our own system of, of traditions in the way that, uh, that we want things to be done. And we want to make sure we, we come back and we follow the system of faith that God has put into place. Uh, and so, how, what, what makes you stumble? What makes, do you stumble sometimes because you're not looking where you're going? Because you're not paying attention? Why did they stumble? They stumbled over the stumbling stone. What's a, what's a stumbling stone? It's a stone that's put there to make you stumble. That's what a stumbling stone is. It's a stone that's put there to make you stumble. Well, who put it there? As it is written, verse 32, Behold, I, wonder who that I is, lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. God put it there. Now, why would God put a stumbling stone out there for somebody to stumble over? If you see the stone, are you going to stumble over it? Not usually. I mean, I know some of us are a little wobbly on our feet, right? But for the most part, if you see a stone out there, you're not going to stumble over it. Well, why did they stumble over it? Because they didn't see it. Well, why didn't they see it? Because they weren't looking for it. They didn't want to see it. What's the stumbling stone? What is this rock of offense? And whoever, look at the end of verse, the end of the, verse 33. And whoever believes on, does it say it? Does it say whoever believes on it, the rock, the stone? No, God just tells us right here, what that stumbling stone is by that pronoun, him. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. What's the stumbling stone? Who's the stumbling stone? That's Jesus. Jesus became, you know, Jesus is, is not only the, the rock of refuge to which, we would, to which we would run, 
but he's also a stumbling stone. Well, what, what is that? That's, does that bother you to say that, to think that? What makes Jesus a stumbling stone over which they stumbled? What, what, what would make Jesus that? What were the Jews looking for? They were looking for a king. What were they looking for? Looking for a military leader. What were they looking for? They're looking for a patriot. They're looking for a national leader. They want somebody to come in and, and, and raise us up as a nation and go out to war for us and win battles for us. And we just, we want this, this king who we have in our minds. And when Jesus came, why was he a stumbling stone? Because they weren't looking. They weren't looking for Jesus of Nazareth. It's not what they were looking for. And when they saw him, when they finally did see him, were they interested as a whole? Oh, no, no, not him. Not he. Somebody's playing a trick on us. Not him. And so what happened? They got themselves in the way. And instead of pursuing a righteousness that comes by faith and doing what God says, they were, pers they were bound and determined to pursue a righteousness that was according to their traditions, according to their likes, according to their wants. Is that going to get the Jews in trouble? Yeah. Would that get us in trouble? So here they are, rejected by God. Why? Because they refused to see Christ. And they refused to accept Christ. Look in chapter 10. Actually, back up to chapter 9 for just a second. Remember chapter 9 and verse 2? Paul says, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Verse 3, I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, the Jews. I wish that if it were possible, that I could even be accursed for them. That's how much Paul loved them. Now come over to chapter 10. You see a similar sentiment here where he's going to talk about the Jews. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. My continual desire for my brethren is that they might be saved, and I would give anything if they could be saved. But they were having a problem. They had refused the righteousness that came from God. And so he says in verse 2, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. It's not grounded in knowledge. Could that be a problem? If you've got a zeal for God, but it's not grounded in Bible knowledge. You've just, you, you're on fire for God, but you don't know where you're going. You're on fire for God, and, and you know, it's just, I, I'm just going to go, and I, I'm going to do, and, and God's just going to be happy with whatever I go and with whatever I do. Is that how it works? This is not a compliment when he says they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Could that get you in trouble in any, in, in any walk of life, to have a zeal but not be based upon knowledge? That, that get you, could that cause some issues? Could that get you in trouble behind the wheel? You have zeal for driving. You don't have a clue how to do it, but you just you got a burning passion for driving, but no knowledge. And you say, yeah, I saw a couple of those people on the road this morning, right? <laughs> you, saw, you saw a couple of those people at the mall yesterday, if anybody was there, right? Well, uh, you know, could that get you in trouble? Yeah. Could it get you in trouble with God to have a zeal, but not be based upon? Yeah, absolutely. Now, flip that around, though. When it comes to serving God, what if you've got a knowledge but no zeal? Well, I, I, I know a lot. I know what God wants me to do. I know what I, sh and, and I, I, could, I could teach it to somebody up one side, down the other, better than anybody else, but I don't have any zeal. Don't have any passion. Don't have any yearning for serving God. Is that good? Is, is that better? Is that be better than the zeal without the knowledge? No, you've got to have both. But their problem was they didn't have the knowledge. Now, we're going to talk about this in just a minute, but whose fault was that that they didn't have the knowledge? Is that God's fault? Could they shake their finger at God and say, God, you didn't tell us. Could they say that? No. They had, the Jews were blessed in the fact that they had the knowledge, all the knowledge they needed given to them by God. That's why I backed up to look at verses 25 through whatever, 29 in chapter 9, because what was God telling them? Look at this. 
He, I, I, I am telling this to you in the prophets, and when we get to the end of chapter 10, we're going to see it again, where he lays down some quotations from the Old Testament. And Paul's not just quoting the Old Testament, just say, hey, look at me, I know the Old Testament. He's quoting the Old Testament because he's saying to these Jews, God told you this a thousand years ago. God told you this 1,500 years ago. Hello? Why aren't you paying attention, Gary? Yeah, you, see, you, you see his concern for his countrymen throughout this. In chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, What advantage has the Jew? And what is the profit of circumcision? And there are a lot of, and he does list several advantages, but he says, Chiefly, primarily, unto them were committed the oracles of God. They had the word of God. Right. But it, they had that zeal, but it wasn't based on faith. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They had that. That was the responsibility. That's the struggle. It wasn't God protecting. Right. They, 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 had been given, they had been given the oracles of God. They had been given all that they needed to, to fully anticipate the coming of Christ. When Jesus came into the world, who should, have, who should have been ready and waiting first in line? I mean, have you ever, have you ever been first in line? You ever, you ever gone to Black Friday sale and you were first one in line? How, how did you know what time they were going to open? How did you know to get there four hours early so you could be first one in line, right? Uh, the Jews should have been first one in line. They knew he was coming. They did, God pinpointed the time frame in which he was going to come and where he was going to come and how he was going to come. They should have been, they should have been at the doorstep saying, we're ready, we've been waiting. But no, they, they weren't interested. And so here they've got a zeal, but it's not based upon the knowledge God would have them to have, but upon their own knowledge. And, and that's what he says in verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, his plan for making man righteous through Christ, they're ignorant of that. But what are they doing then? They're seeking to establish their own righteousness. Well, that sounds like a good idea, right? I don't know what God wants me to do to get right, so I'll just do it my way. That sounds like a great idea. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. They had all of this figured out in their own minds, but his plan and his way of, um, of creating and, and uh, making someone right, that's not what they were interested in. Verse 4, he says, here's what they missed. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Does everybody have the word end? I don't, I don't remember what other translations say there. The end of the law. Anybody got a different word than the word end? I can't remember if there's a, another translation. What does that mean? You got goal? That's what I want. You think of some, you, Jesus is the end of the law. What does that mean? Uh, well, you, some, some people would read that and say, well, Jesus ended the law. Jesus was nailed to the cross, and Colossians 2.14 says what happened to the old law. It was nailed to the cross with him. It ended with him. That's not what this means. That's true, that, that the law ended with Christ. That would be a true statement, but that's not what this means. This says that Christ is the end of the law, or as that translation that Gary mentioned, it's the goal. He's the goal of the law. In, in a... In a and a companion book with the book of Romans is the book of Galatians. And Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19 says, What purpose then does the law serve? What's the purpose of the law? What was Paul's answer in Galatians 3? To bring us to Christ. That's the goal of the law. That's the purpose of the law. And so that's what this verse in verse 4 is saying. Here, here was the law the Jews had. What's the goal? What's the purpose? What's the end of it? To bring us to Christ. Should the Jews have known that? better than anybody else. And they totally missed it. The, and, and notice the word everyone in verse 4. Christ is the end of the law for, for, so that everybody could be made righteous. How do, you think that's, how do you think that felt to the Jews? Were they interested in everyone being made righteous? He keeps dropping that throughout this book. Uh, even in, in those theme verses back in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, that, that salvation was for, the, for, for all who believed, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And that's what he's saying again here, is that God had a plan for righteousness. It was not going to be coming uh, through that old law. 
The old law was pointing to his system of righteousness that was going to be found in Christ. But the old law wasn't going to bring it about. Only Christ would. But I want you to see what he does with this plan um, that God had. Start in verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. How, how could somebody be made righteous by the old law? What would they have to do to be justified by that old law? Would they have to keep it perfectly? In order, in order to be justified by that old law, they would have to keep it perfectly. Now, were the Jews able to do that? No, well, they couldn't do that. Moses writes about the righteousness uh, which comes from the old law. And here's what Moses says in, uh, in Leviticus chapter 18. The man who does these things, does those things, shall live by them. Now, that's, doing them and living by them, those are not synonyms in this verse. Sometimes we think about those as synonyms. But living by them is talking about, that's a future tense. That's talking about an eternal reward. The man who does these things, who does all of these things, in other words, He's, he's going to be made to live by them in heaven. Well, but nobody can do all of them. So what's the contrast? Contrast in verse 5 is that the righteousness that came from the law only came through perfect obedience. But the righteousness in verse 6, the righteousness that God had in mind, that comes from the New Testament, that comes from the gospel, it's called the righteousness of faith here, speaks in this way. And so he quotes, he quotes again from Moses, but this time he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And he says uh, in verse 6, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, who's going to go into heaven to bring Christ down? Who's going to do that? We need somebody to do that. We need somebody to go to heaven and bring Christ down. But he says, that's not what you, don't say that in your heart. Verse 7, Or, who will ascend into the abyss? In other words, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Who's going to say that? Who's going to say, we need to go up into heaven to get Christ to come down here and live among us and die for us. And then after Christ dies, who's going to say, you, who's going to go down to the abyss to bring him back from the dead? What's his point? His point is, in verse 5, there's a righteousness that, by the law that would come through perfect obedience. But the righteousness that comes by faith doesn't require the impossible. Who could go to heaven to bring Christ down? Could you even afford that plane ticket? Who's going to go to heaven to bring Christ down? You couldn't do that. Okay, after Christ died, who's going to go down and who's going, who's going to raise him up from the dead? Who, who's, who's, who's got the ability to do that? That's, that's impossible. That's not, now, does God require the impossible from you as a Christian? No. Guess what God has already done? He's already done that. Christ has already taken care of those things. And so here, here is a righteousness that comes by faith that Christ has already taken care of by the sacrifice that He made for us. Verse 8, but what does it say? The Word is near you. Now again, all, these, these, these last three verses, He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. The Word is near you. It's even in your mouth and in your heart. What is he saying? He's not, he's not talking about near or far as in distance. What would be impossible? What would be hard? Oh, go to heaven, bring Christ down. That'd be pretty hard. Oh, go down to the abyss and bring Christ up. No, that's pretty hard. No, 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 that's not the word that he's giving you. The word that he's giving you is a lot easier for you to do. That's the, the word near there. The word is near unto you. Not talking about distance. It's talking about our ability to do something and it's easy for you to... Is that true? Is, is obeying God something that's easy? He says it's in your mouth and in your heart. What do we need to do to obey God? That is the word of faith that we preach. Here's what we do. Here's, here's how easy it is. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, 
you will be saved. Is that pretty easy? The word is near unto you. Here are these Jews. Here are these Jews that, that were not looking for Christ in, in the form that in which he came. They, they, they had kept it much more distant and kept it much more difficult for them to recognize him. But if they would have seen Jesus for who he was and seen Jesus for what he did for them, Jesus went to the cross. He died upon that cross. He was buried. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And God says, do you believe that in your heart? Are you ready to confess that with your mouth? That's pretty easy to do. Compared to what Jesus did, that's pretty easy. Compared to the perfect requirements that were required under that Old Testament, that's pretty easy. Now, some people will come to that passage and say, oh, okay, that's all I've got to do. All I have to do is believe with my heart and confess with my mouth. Is that all that I have to do? You know, sometimes we come to a passage, is there anything else even in this book itself that would teach us that there are things that are encompassed within that, that action of faith? There are, there are requirements that God has of me that are encompassed within that righteousness of faith that I must, that I must do. Uh, go, go back for just a minute to chapter 1. Some of you, some of you have not been as a part of this class, and I, I want to share some things just briefly with you. I want you to look in chapter 1, and I want you to look in chapter 16. I want you to see how, how this book begins and how it ends. In chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says, Through him... We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. The first time he mentions faith in this book, he ties obedience to it. In God's mind, true faith involves obedience. Go to the last chapter. Go to the end of the book. And, and it's going to be the last time that he's going to mention faith in this book is in chapter 16. Down in verse 26, chapter 16, verse 26. Talking about the gospel is now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures, made, no, made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. First time Paul mentions faith, he ties it to obedience. Last time Paul mentions faith, he ties it to obedience. How does God view true faith. God says it's tied to obedience. Somebody says, well, you're, you're just making stuff up. Well, go back to chapter 10 where we're studying. Go back to chapter 10. Because what he's going to do is, as we finish out this chapter is he's going to start using some words interchangeably. And two of the words he's going to use interchangeably are the words believe and the word obey. Look in verse 16. Go back to chapter 10 look in verse 16. He quotes from Isaiah. He quotes from the very first verse of Isaiah chapter 53 where the question is asked, Lord, who has believed our report? The question is, uh, you know, the, the report about Jesus has gone out. Lord, who has believed our report? But how does Paul interpret that verse? Look at the beginning of verse 16. The interpretation that Paul has of those who has believed our report is that there are people who have not done what to the report? They haven't obeyed the gospel. In this one verse, what does Paul do? He takes the believe and he interchanges it and uses it synonymously with the word obey. God looks at true faith as obedience. And when someone does not, when someone does not obey God, God looks at that person as not having faith. Who has believed, who, who's believed our report? Did the Jews believe it? Well, maybe they thought they did, but they were not ready to obey it. When we have a true faith in God, it's going to lead us to obedience. One more verse. Go to chapter 6, just as a way of overview and as a way of reminder. Go back to chapter 6, where we're going to see this word obey again in verse 17. Where he says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin... Yet you obeyed from the heart 
that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. We don't have time to uh, develop that entirely, but what is the form of doctrine? What is that, the, the word form there, a model, uh, a pattern? What was the pattern that was delivered unto them? Well, back up. Paul is just referencing something he mentioned earlier in this chapter. Look in verse 3 of chapter 6. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. Therefore, we were buried with Him. We died in verse 3. We were buried in verse 4 with Him into, with, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What's the form? What's the pattern that was delivered to us? Jesus died. He was buried. He was raised again. How do we obey that form? We die, we are buried in baptism, we are raised to walk in newness of life, and God says, that's a part of my obedience to the gospel. And that's the only way that I can walk in that new life that He has in, uh, planned for me. So come back to chapter 10. I want us to see that as, as we look at those familiar verses, verses 9 and 10, that God is not saying that this is all that is necessary in order to be saved any more than he was saying in chapter 6 that baptism is all that is necessary. In neither place did he say. But what he is saying in, verse, in chapter 10 is, this is something you can do. This is something simple that you can do. It is near to you. You can believe in your heart that, Jesus would, that God raised Jesus from the dead. You can confess with your mouth that, that you believe this. And when you do that, the end of verse 9 says you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, what does the scripture say? What's the first word in this quotation? Whoever. The Jews, they, the Jews had this in their scripture for, uh, well, for 700 years before Jesus ever came. I'm not sure how strongly they worked at, looked at that word whoever. Whoever, does that include Gentiles too? Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Who did God want to be saved? Everybody. Who did Jesus die for? Who did, uh, who did God give His plan of salvation to? Everybody, when, when he gave the Great Commission, he said, go into your favorite parts of the world and teach it to your favorite people. Right? Wrong. You go to everybody. Why? Because God wants all men to be saved. And so the Bible says, in God's view, in God's eyes, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Is there any distinction in God's eyes between black and white? Any distinction in God's eyes between a male and a female? Any distinction in God's eyes between a, uh, um, someone born in America and, and someone born in Europe or Asia or Africa? Or when God looks down at man, who does God, who does God want to be saved? Every last one of them. Who did Jesus die for? Every last one of them. Do I need, do I need to learn to look at people the way God looks at people? Where there is no distinction. We don't need to chop, our, chop our, um, our nation, our world up into groups. What group do you fit in? Oh, you're one of them. You fit into this group. You, uh, oh, uh, is there a dis careful how you answer this. Is there a distinction between Republicans and Democrats in God's eyes? You didn't react like that to anything else I asked. Guess what? I need to have eyes that don't see any difference between anybody's skin color, anybody's political views. And why? Because God told me to go to everybody with this gospel and teach it to them because He wants every one of them to be saved. And then when we're all saved, guess what? It doesn't matter. If, it doesn't matter who we are. God has in mind, oh boy, we could spend a lot of time there. Why? Because He is the same Lord not a different Lord. Is God a different Lord for the Jew than He is for the Greek? No. Is He a different Lord for, uh, for the Republicans than He is for the Democrats? 
No, he's the same Lord. Now, what is his position? He is over all. Too many people have brought God down here. Oh, you're, you're, you're beside me, or you're below. No, he is over all and is rich to, who is he rich to? Everybody who calls upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Guess what? We saw believe up in verses 9 and 10. We saw confess up in verses 9 and 10. Now we're seeing a different step of salvation. And this calls on the name of the Lord. Somebody says, no, that's not a different step. That's, that's confessing. It's, it's not, it is not synonymous with confessing. Let's keep reading verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? You've got to believe first before you can call. How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? You've got to hear first. Well, how are you going to hear? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? God has a progression of evangelism that the preacher is sent that somebody hears the gospel they believe the gospel they obey the gospel by calling on the name of the lord we don't have time uh well we're going to take it anyway go to acts chapter 2 hold your finger here in romans 10 because i'm not going to wait for you to get back here all right stick your finger there we're coming right back here come to acts chapter 2 And, and you might just write these verses. If, if you take notes in your Bible, you might write these two verses from Acts 2 next to uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. Because what you have in Romans, or not Romans, in Acts 2. In Acts 2 and verse 21, here's Peter preaching. And Peter says, It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Well, that's what we're reading over in Romans chapter 10. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved saved from what saved from a bad day saved from what saved from their in-laws saved from what what are they being saved from being saved from their sins that's what they're being saved from when you think about when you hear when you talk about somebody being saved there's nothing more important than being saved from their sins that's what so what do i need according to verse 21 what do i need to do to be saved from my sins Call on the name of the Lord. Same preacher, same sermon, same day. Look in verse 38. What did he say? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Did he just, did he just totally change his tune and come up with a whole new plan of salvation? Or is he talking about the same thing? These people were pricked in their heart. They already believed in verse 37. So having been pricked in their heart, he says, here's the next thing you need to do. Repent and be baptized. Come back to Romans chapter 10. Back, back in Romans chapter 10, that's the progression that God has for His plan of salvation. is for someone to hear it, for somebody to believe it, and for someone to call on the name of the Lord. If you're still making notes in the margin of your Bible, next to Acts 2.21, Acts 2.38, you might write Acts 22.16 where Paul was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. How do I call on the name of the Lord? I've got to be baptized. That's what this is talking about. But God had rejected Israel. He rejected them because they had rejected Jesus in chapter 9, had rejected His righteousness here in chapter 10. And as we close out chapter 10, He had rejected them because they had rejected His gospel message. We looked in verse 16. They have not all obeyed the Jews. They haven't obeyed the gospel. 750 years ago, Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? Well, the Jews haven't. Why not? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So what was their problem in verse 38? Have they not heard? What was their problem? Had they not heard? What does he say? Yes, indeed, they've heard. The sound has gone out to all the earth. They have heard what God said. Okay, so what's their problem? Verse 19. Did Israel not know? Did they not understand? Oh, yes, they've understood and they've understood because God has been at work to, to provoke them by uh, saving the Gentiles to get their attention. So what is their problem? Verse 20. Their problem is, in verses 20 and 21, that they are a stubborn people. And as he closes this chapter, he's going to contrast one more time the Gentiles and the Jews. Verse 20 talks about the Gentiles. 
I was found by those who did not seek me. And I was manifest to those who did not ask for me. The Gentiles were not looking for him. They were not asking for him. They were not seeking God. And guess who found him? Gentiles did. But what about Israel? What's the first word you got in verse 21? But to Israel. Here's the contrast. God was found by people that he was not pursuing at the time. But all day long he stretched out his hands to the Jews. All day long he was trying to get the Jews to obey him. But what kind of people were they? A disobedient and contrary people. What was their problem? Why did they reject Jesus? Why did they reject the gospel? Because they were a disobedient, contrary, stubborn people. They had to have it their way, had to see it their way. It could only go their way and no other way. And if that wasn't going to happen, they weren't going to follow after God. What an attitude to have. God help us not to have that attitude. It says it's got to be my way or no way. It's got to be the way I see it or no way at all. How warped is that? Instead, we need to come to God and God's Word and say, you know what, whatever God says, that's what I'm going to pursue. And I'm going to try to find God wherever God has told me to find Him according to His Word. So much more there. This is just a rich, rich book. Continue to read this. We'll look in chapter 11 next week. Thank you all for your good attention this morning. Worship will begin in just a few minutes, about 10 o'clock.